Today, The Last of Us Part 2 is finally releasing, so I can live out my dream of living in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. 2020 hit really hard. But, unfortunately, my copy hasn't arrived yet, and when it does, I need to quarantine it for 14 days. So, to keep myself busy, I have decided to share with you a deep dive into the science behind The Last of Us. For those of you who are uninitiated, The Last of Us follows the journey of two individuals, Joel and Ellie, who travel across America in the wake of a global pandemic, which at this point in time feels eerily familiar. Their journey takes place 20 years after the collapse of society, which was driven by a fungal pathogen which could control the minds of human beings, turning them into effectively zombies. Anyway, after their adventure wraps up, they settle down and live happily ever after. But could this happen? in the real world. Now I don't mean the bit about happy endings, it's 2020 and I'm pretty sure those are a thing of the past, but what I want to know about is the mind controlling fungus. Could that ever exist within the realms of reality? To cut to the chase, it kind of does. The fungus that they used in The Last of Us is actually based on a real world fungus, a fungus belonging to the family called Ophia cordyceps. That's kind of confusing because in The Last of Us they call it the cordyceps fungus, which is a completely different taxonomic group, but um, we're going to call it Ophiocordyceps, that's its real name, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. Ophiocordyceps fungi infect insects, and when they do that, they change the behaviour of their host to increase their spread and their ability to infect other individuals. The most famous member of this family of funguses is called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which was discovered by Alfred Russell Wallace and infects carpenter ants. When the spores of this fungus land on the head of a carpenter ant, the fungus's roots, which we call hyphae, begin to grow through the exoskeleton of the ant towards its brain. And when the roots get there, they begin to secrete loads and loads of chemicals which change the way the ant's brain works. The result of this is that the ant's behaviours begin to change. It starts to twitch and spasm its muscles. On top of that, the ant will begin a journey through the foraging trails of its colony. While this is going on, the roots of the fungus continue to grow through the ant's exoskeleton and start to focus their attention on the muscles attached to the jaws of the ant. The ant will begin to climb a tree above the foraging trail and it will latch on with its jaws to the underside of a leaf. At this point in time, the muscles attached to the ant's jaws decay and the jaws are locked in place. The ant physically can't move them. And the fungus will continue to grow throughout the ant's body until it dies. Its soft tissue is replaced with fungus. And eventually, when the fungus is ready, it sprouts out from the ant and begins to release its spores onto unsuspecting ants below. So that's how the real Ophiocordyceps works and controls the minds of the insects it infects. But to put an end to the horrors of 2020, that fungus would need to jump from insects to humans. As I mentioned, there are plenty of species of Ophiocordyceps and they infect moths, ants, arachnids like spiders, as well as dragonflies. But as far as we're aware, there are none so far which can infect humans or other bony animals. The likely reason we don't tend to see fungi which can infect these animals is because they have a bony case around their brain in the form of a skull. And for Ophiocordyceps to get to the brain, it would need to burrow through the skull. However, that's not to say that other diseases which alter the behavior of humans and other animals don't exist. Toxoplasma gondii is a single-celled animal which infects cats and mice. And when it gets into a mouse, it affects its brain to make the mouse more brave. But on top of that, it causes the mouse to think that the smell of cat urine is the same smell as that of a potential mate. Because of that, the mice will track down areas where cats live. So the cats eat the brave mice. But while the mice are being digested, the Toxoplasma gondii begins to form eggs. And these eggs can be found in the poo of the cat. And once the cat goes to the toilet, there's a chance that a mouse will come across that poo and eat it, infecting itself and continuing the cycle. The interesting thing about Toxoplasma gondii though is that it doesn't just infect cats and mice. It can also be found in humans. And it's believed that infection by Toxoplasma gondii may be related to diseases such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression. But if Toxoplasma can get to your brain, why can't Ophiocordyceps? Simply put, it comes down to the ways in which they both infect us. Toxoplasma makes its way into your body through your digestive system. You eat something that contains its egg, and then that egg goes through your digestive tract 
is absorbed by a macrophage, a kind of white blood cell, and then that white blood cell will accidentally carry it to the brain like a Trojan horse. Ophiocordyceps, on the other hand, makes its way to the brain of an insect by using mechanical force and enzymes to degrade and break down the exoskeleton of the creatures. The way Ophiocordyceps infects its hosts means that it's unlikely we'll see clickers walking around London anytime soon, but it's not strictly impossible especially considering it's 2020 after all.